Hi, everybody. You're listening to the Oneness Junkie podcast, hosted by me, Lydia Smith, a self-proclaimed Oneness Junkie. Oneness Junkie is a place to be inspired, encouraged, and supported. Learn from the individuals who are working to make the world a better place. Let's meet today's guest. Hi, everyone. It's Lydia with the Oneness Junkie podcast and YouTube channel. And today I'm sitting here with Mark Chabas. Hi, Mark. How are you? Fine. Did I say that right? It's Chabas, but that's okay. (laughs) Chabas. I'm sorry. As soon as I said it, I thought, okay, I don't know if that's right. So I wanted to just introduce you all to Mark and how I met Mark and discuss what interesting things he's up to in the world. As you all know, I like to highlight people who are making the world a better place. And frankly, I feel like Mark is doing that. So we're going to talk about how he's doing that today on the show. So thanks so much for being here, Mark. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. And, and I'm not the slightest bit upset about the mispronunciation of my name. It's been <laughs> it's been mispronounced my entire life. So you start to become a little bit comfortable with that. But I have to say yeah. that my favorite pronunciation was when I was in culinary school. I went to French culinary school and uh, my I had a French chef and he used to call me Shabu. <laughs> so that was my favorite. <laughs> That's funny. Um French, the French accent is funny, actually. So let's actually, a lot of y'all know it's um, something I like to do is let my guests know whether I already know my guest or not. And in this case, I don't know Mark. All I know about him is just a little bit from a initial phone call um, meeting, a video call that we did, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, just to kind of meet each other and decide if there would be a match for him to come on as a guest on the show. And he was part of a podcast group that I'm in because he has a podcast too. And we're going to talk about that. And so we really connected because our podcasts are somewhat similar. I mean, we both have an understanding about source and about oneness. And I thought, oh, I'd love to have you on the show. So that's why he's on the show today. And so I'm going to give him the mic and let him introduce himself to you all and just give us a little background, like where you came from and, you know, what led you your life up to this point where you are today and what we're going to be talking about today. Sounds great. Well, thank you again for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, yes, we had a great conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was it was kind of hard to get off because we had so much in common, and you know there was just that mutual understanding about spirituality and consciousness. And um, to your point, you know, yes, we met in that um, podcast group, and I think you had sent me a link just to check out your story and. I listened and I figured I'll just listen for a couple of minutes and I got hooked into the entire episode (laughs) and uh, I loved your story um, about what you had experienced and um, the loss and, and what you, you know, what you transformed the grief into and what that was like for you and how that sort of led to your spiritual journey and your like understanding of oneness. And so I knew immediately I needed to connect with you and It was a similar story for me, you know, like, of course, we would be a match because I also had a tragic loss that I experienced. And it was the impetus for my spiritual growth and understanding. And so I guess we could start with that. We'll start with that story. So my book, yes, is called Remembering Your Spirit. And the book is about that tragedy. So in 2001, I lost my girlfriend in the World Trade Center. She was working on the 101st floor um, for Cantor Fitzgerald. And, um, you know, of course, that was a horrible tragedy that I personally experienced, but the whole world experienced, right? We all sort of went through it together. And um, for me, the reason why it was, you know, the beginning of my spiritual growth, I think almost all tragedies are at least an opportunity for a spiritual awakening. You know, of course, we there's um there's always the option to not go in that direction even though there's always the calling right 
It's like the calling is there, but we have to pick up the phone. Um, but yeah, so the, the tragedy was an opportunity for me to, you know, look into that personally. And what really pushed me in this in the direction of spirituality was because for me, there were a lot of mystical experiences tied into her loss. So, you know, I'll start with that story. So the, the night before um, Lynn passed away, um, I was watching Larry King live. You know, Larry King obviously he has his talk show. And he had a show and it was like 9, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. And this was probably closer to maybe, um, I don't remember which one, but it was either the midnight or the 3 o'clock one. And he had John Edwards, the psychic medium, on as a guest. You know John Edwards, right? Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it's John Edward or John Edwards, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so it was, so he was interviewing John Edwards. I can't say that I had like this really deep understanding about any of the stuff that we're about to talk about at the time, but there was always a curiosity about it. There was always an interest about it. And I grew up um, with, in a very religious household. Um, but there were a lot of unanswered questions. And in my opinion, there was a lot of contradiction. And there was also, um, there wasn't a lot of alignment between what I believed inside of me. And I don't know why I believed what I believed and what I was being taught, you know. And so, you know, but there was an interest and a curiosity in the afterlife, right? So he had John Edward on as a guest. And um so they were fielding calls, right? So people were calling up and they were like connecting with John Edwards and he was giving them like mini readings. And this woman called up and John Edwards said, I wonder if, um, so, so this woman called up and basically John Edwards said to her that you, your, your husband had passed away and you hadn't yet told your children that your husband passed away and you were walking through the park one day with the kids and you saw a feather come down and the feather landed in front of you. And you took that as a sign that it was time to tell your children about your husband, their father. And for whatever reason, I was like the waterworks kicked in and I got like so emotionally overwhelmed by this story because you could hear her crying. So her tears and her emotions validated that he was onto something, right? There was some evidence there. So like just the whole story and everything that was going on just hit me and I started getting really emotional and I listened to the rest of the show and I was laying there in bed and I couldn't sleep. And I'm thinking, who could I talk to that is close to death as if I knew, but close to death. So I can make some kind of an arrangement or a pact with them that when they pass away, that they'll come back and give me some kind of like sign or message or something like that. Cause I hadn't had anything like that. And I was like going through all the people in my head and, you know, eventually I ended up falling asleep. The next morning was, you know, the morning of 9-11. I was living at home at the time. I lived in my parents' basement um, and my mom had come like flying down the stairs and she was screaming, Lynn's building, Lynn's building. And I was like groggy and a little bit confused. And um, she turned on the television and I saw that the tower, one of the two towers had been hit and there were showing like the flames and the smoke and everything. And I was just really confused and disoriented. I picked up my phone and tried to call her, but I couldn't get a call through to her. And, um, and then like shortly thereafter, the second building had hit. And that's when I realized like, this is, this is like a serious situation and I can't get in touch with her. And I was, so I had gone upstairs and I was watching sort of everything unfold on the big screen in the living room. And I was pacing back and forth because I was starting to feel nervous, you know, like the, the the fear was kicking in a little bit, going from optimism to, oh, my God, she, you know, could be hurt or something. And I had this overwhelming feeling like somebody was standing behind me. And the way that I describe it is that when you're at a party and you're talking to someone and you feel someone like looking at you. And so I like turned around and we had two glass like French doors that led out to the back patio. And so I turned around and up against the glass, I saw a feather and the feather was like sort of drifting back and forth. And I went over to the window and I opened the window and it fell to the ground. So the window by the window, I mean the door because it was one glass door. And so I opened it and I picked up the feather 
And there was a part of me that knew that that was a message from Lynn, but I didn't want to really believe it. Right. So I put it in a jar, I stashed it and I just continued, you know, trying to call her parents and trying to get in touch with her. And I couldn't get in touch with her at all. And her parents weren't able to get in touch with her. And then you couldn't go into the city for, I want to say two days maybe. And then we finally were able to go into the city. And then we just started like a week long search for her, basically me and thousands of other people were on this just massive search, just trying to find people that were missing. And we would put up flyers and we would go around like, try to just get because there were so many rumors flying around that there were a lot of people that made it out of the building but they were disoriented and they were like in new jersey or they were in upstate new york or maybe brooklyn or something like that so we were like taking all these stories and going where we were told to go um all the while i mean the truth is there no there were no none of those people really had survived it was just a lot of stories that were floating around but Um, so even though I had that sort of inner knowing that she was gone, you know, and that was my sign, I didn't want to believe it. So I continued that. But then as things progressed, there was like one mystical experience after another. And that's why I wrote the book because the, the stories were really unbelievable. And if I didn't have other people there to witness these things, then I would probably think that I was making it all up in my head. And I would just hold on to that. But because there were always other people that were there as a witness to corroborate what was going on, you know, it made it all the more real for me. And it was like, as a skeptic, an open-minded skeptic, if there is such thing as one that I would call myself, it was, it was easier for me to accept that these things were happening. So moving forward, one day I had come home from the city and I was I had parked my truck in the driveway and I was walking up to the front door and I heard my name being called by somebody. And it was my neighbor that lived across the street. And she was like, Mark, Mark. And I turn around and she says, you know, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, while you were in the city today, there was a white dove um, on your car, on your truck. Um, And it was like on the truck and it was walking around the truck and it was, And I'll be honest with you, I was not really believing her. I was like, oh, I think maybe this is something that she's thinking happened to make herself feel better. Or maybe not that I thought she was a liar or anything, but this is how kind of skeptical I was. Anyway, not even like 30 seconds after I'm thinking this while she's telling me the story, she says to me, I had a feeling that you would not believe me. So I went in and I grabbed my camera. I'm like, this is back in the day, this is over 20 years ago where we not everyone didn't have an iPhone with a camera on right. it. Right. It was more like a so digital she, camera. It was a digital camera. And she <laughs> took pictures of this pure white dove. And she went up to CVS and she printed them out. And she handed me a stack of pictures. And sure enough, there were there was this white dove. And so, you know, that was another sign for me that she this was some high somehow tied into her you know and then yeah connection yeah there was a connection and to take it a step further um because by the way i one part that i didn't want to that i didn't not want to mention but i forgot to mention was that when my grandfather passed away my mom's dad she was devastated she had gone to the beach you know just to sort of like clear her thoughts and and sort of i guess calm herself down or whatever And she tells this story about like how she fell asleep and she woke up and there was a white dove right next to her at the beach. And I always questioned it, like maybe she fell asleep and it was just a dream and she thinks it was real. So when Mrs. Corello, my neighbor, was telling me the story, I was kind of thinking, oh, this is another one of those things where somebody thinks they saw something. So when she handed me the pictures, I couldn't refute it anymore. Like now I had like the hard evidence. And then to take it a step further, my neighbor that lives across the street and next door to her, right, who I had never known, by the way. So there was Mrs. Carello lived across the street from me. And then one house to the right of her, it was a two family and they rented out the second floor. And there was a couple that lived up there, but I never met them. Like I would see them get into their cars and stuff, but I never interacted, never interacted with them. So anyway, she says to me, you know, the crazy thing, Mark, is that there was actually another white dove. And she said it was on Lisa's truck. And I'm like, who's Lisa? 
you know, <laughs> and she, she's like, Lisa is my neighbor who lives right next door. So there were two white doves. One was on my truck. One was on Lisa's truck. And I, ca- I came to find out that Lisa's husband worked with Lynn for Canna Fitzgerald and also perished in the attacks of 9-11. So th- that's what I mean by how can you deny that this stuff is happening? This is this goes way further than just like us wanting to believe yeah. in some kind of communication. Or coincidence, coincidence, also beyond coincidence. Right. So that was, you know, so there were many stories like that, you know, of um, of after death communication, I would say. And because that was existing, it, it, how could it not make me question if Lynn is still communicating with me? then that must mean that in some capacity, she's still alive. That must mean that even if her body is not functioning anymore, that some part of her has gone somewhere, but still has access to me. And so it started like steamrolling all these questions about who I am and why am I here? And where do we go after this? Where were we before this? And that's really when the journey began for me. You know, that was really when, I started like diving into, oh my God, I'm sure you could imagine every author I could get my hands on, every book about reincarnation, near death experience, after death communication, um, spirituality, oneness, um, universal love, unconditional love. Like, I mean, you name it. There was, to me, there was nothing off limits. I just wanted to (laughs) absorb as much as I could so I could sort of grow my understanding uh, far beyond what it was at that time. So, and that's really what the story is about. It's about all of those experiences that I had and then all the things that I did to sort of navigate and uh, investigate all of these topics that I just brought up. And also, you know, at the same time, um, because I was grieving and I was suffering from po- post-traumatic stress, Um, I developed anxiety, which I had never had before, and I developed panic attacks and social anxiety. And also I had um, lots of health problems too. I couldn't digest food and I had like just, I had gastro issues and stomach issues and like there were so many things going on with me and I was going to every doctor that you can imagine, right? Like trying to figure it out specialists in New York, New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, just like doctor hopping, you know, like just trying to figure if I find the right doctor, finding the, yeah, finding find the out, answers, right? Find the answers, what's wrong with my body. And then once I fix my body, then I continue, then I can continue on my spiritual journey and, and like figure out the rest after that. And uh, I, w- I found a lot of great doctors and that there were a lot of diagnoses and there were lots <laughs> of medications and they worked for a little while and then they stopped working. And then I would go back to another doctor. And I can't remember exactly how, but I stumbled across Edgar Casey. So I had, had not been familiar with Edgar Casey, but for your listeners um, that might not know who Edgar Casey is, he was called America's Sleeping Prophet. And he used to go into a trance-like state. And he was able to visit what's called the Akashic Records, which is a record of everything that's ever happened to you in every single one of your lives. And, uh, and, and everybody also else's. Was, and everybody and else's. Everybody else's. Yeah. yeah. And exactly. everything that's ever happened, period. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so he was able to diagnose people's illnesses um, and tell them like what, what maybe allopathic medicine could not you know, discover or discern. Right. And, um, and he would offer some type of prescription or like a cure for whatever was going on. And it was all sorts of, I'm sure you've looked into his stuff too. It was all sorts of bizarre stuff like heating pads and castor oil and saline solutions. And, but it worked for a lot of people and he diagnosed over 10,000 people. I mean, it was quite, you know, a large array of people. So I was like, he was long since passed away, but I longed for this um, like opportunity to meet someone like Edgar Casey that could finally tell me what was wrong with me because I couldn't get my answers through allopathic medicine. And it probably was like maybe a week later, I saw an article in the, in the back of a new age, like magazine, like a body, mind and spirit. And it was a little like classified ad, you know, and it said Edgar Casey 
Bob Johnson, Edgar Casey style readings. So I immediately grab the phone. I call up this, you know, the phone number and Bob answers the phone. And I explain <laughs> to him, you know, that I'm interested in getting a reading. He seems like this really nice guy. He explains to me what the process is like. We book the call, you know, we book the meeting. He tells me basically to come up with 20 questions. I think it was about 20 questions. And uh, we had our meeting. So he was, you know, he was booked for a while. So I finally eventually made it in there. And this meeting with Bob, when he went into trance, just like Edgar Casey did, and was able to also access the Akashic Records, um, immediately I was downloaded with all of this information. And so by that, I mean, like, why I, why I was here on this physical earth, right? Um, why Lynn left early, why I was connected to Lynn, um, you know, what was wrong with me physically, how I could heal what was wrong with me physically. And yeah, basically what I came here to do, what my mission was here on earth, laid the whole thing out for me. And so that was, that was incredible because it felt right to me. You know, it's not like, it might've been the first time I was hearing it, but it was almost felt more like a validation rather than like when someone tells you like, you're going to be this and you're like, no, there's no way. No, for me, it made sense to me, you know, and I'm only like 21 years old at the time. I was going to ask you how old you were at this time. Cause I yeah, was curious. I listened, yeah. I listened back to the tapes, Lydia, and I sound like a little kid, you know, like I, I hear my voice and I thought I was so old cause I was at, you know, it was after college and, uh, and I'm, I was a little kid. I was literally a little kid. And he was telling me that I was going to, you know, basically my whole life was going to be focused around spirituality and that I would be someone that would teach people about spirituality and all these things. And I'm like, wait, what? Because, you know, I was a psych major. I've always cared about people. I've always, you know, um, I've always, I had an interest in spirituality. I shouldn't say that the interest was brand new. It's just my only reference to spirituality was through my religion, you know? And so, Same here. Yeah. And so and, and I won't go into that because that could be a whole different show, but you, you know what I'm talking about with that. So it was, you know, opening the door to a whole different way of looking at spirituality. Um, and so anyway, so back to the not feeling well with my physical body, basically he said, you're suffering from the guilt. And then when I say he, Bob went into a trance, but he was actually channeling 12 archangels, a group of 12 angels. Wow. called called the tutelage and um and and he had said to me yeah and he had said to me that um um i mean he said so much so i'm trying to remember exactly like the most important what were you going to say was he talking about your future like what you were going to be doing you know with yes, the work you. yeah so he did and that so he talked about my speaking and spirituality and healing and mediumship and um but at the time like i said i was a kid and i also was in culinary school so <laughs> i was i was i had the psych background but i was i went to i was in the french culinary institute i was training to become a chef and you know lynn and i were planning to get married and our goal was that i w- was going to open up a restaurant you know and we were gonna that was going to be our life and then, of course, you know, when, when she passed away and I went through all that, I dropped out of culinary school because I was, you know, I was just I couldn't handle it. And and cooking was a way for me to express my happiness, my creativity, my artisticness, you know, um, and I didn't feel I, I connected to any of that when I was grieving. Right. Right. So it was like, but, you know it was, it was just a really difficult time. I did end up going back to culinary school and that's, you know, I talk about that in the, in the book too. And it took me a while till I could get to that point where I had to start over. But what I was experiencing in terms of suffering was the guilt of trying to put my life back together and trying to move on after Lynn, you know what I yeah. mean? Like and yeah. I never put that together. I never made yeah. that connection. Yeah, let me ask you some questions because you've provided a lot of good content. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let me ask you some questions about the stuff that you just said. So I'm yeah. super curious 
how long do you feel like you went through the grief's journey? You know, the journey of grief. I'm, I'm curious about that. Like how long did yeah. that take? And That's I know good. it's, it's still, ex, it still exists, right? Like it's just floating around if, in moments you can just feel a sadness of a loss, right? That you experience. Yeah, I, that. I think that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, my personal answer would be different than everybody else. But for me, you know, between 2001 and 2007, that's the time it took for me to get to a point where I could honestly say that I healed from that trauma. And, and this is my, this is how I can say that I felt healed from the trauma. I'll never, and, and by saying healed by the trauma, specifically what I mean is that somebody else could bring it up and not trigger me because throughout my grieving process and my healing process, I could talk about Lynn. I could talk about the tragedy. I could talk about the situation and all that if I was in control. But if I was living my life, like let's say I was at a party or a social event or something like that, and somebody blindsided me and brought up her. Uh It became emotional. I was triggered. And I couldn't really function. And that led to sort of like a lot of the social anxiety that I developed. But my answer would be it took about seven years. And the and the way that I knew that like it was eventually healed for me was that anybody could bring it up in any context at any time and I could feel good about it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I can say that I could feel good about it, and it doesn't mean that I don't miss her, her physical body, her, you know, like who she was as a person. It's that I have this greater awareness or this understanding that her body is not here, but she's still very much alive. Right. And that, if, and if I want to continue to have a relationship with her, I can. And so if it, what we, what we miss and I, you know, I'm, I can only really speak for myself, but what I would miss is a relationship with that person. Right. Like, you know, I've lost many people since, since Lynn. Right but she was my first great loss. And, um, and we, we lose that companionship, like someone that you can hold on to someone that you can embrace someone that you can have a conversation with, you know, but, but there is also the opportunity to continue that relationship after the person has left their physical body, if you choose. And she chose to share that with me. I wouldn't have that knowledge if it wasn't for her making it so obvious to me that we could continue our relationship and one other thing we what i've learned is that i chose this all before i took my first breath i chose my parents i chose the location where i was going to be born i chose my siblings my friends i chose lynn she chose her death she we chose to have the relationship that we did for as long as we did and you know it was all predestined i never thought about any of that before that And so if you really, if that's true, which I believe it to be true from my own personal experiences, Mm -hmm. then what is there to be so sad about, right? Like it's all beautiful. It's all happening exactly the way it's meant to happen. So I'm so funny you brought that up. Like so much about this podcast episode is like spirit led and source led because I was going to ask a question that was related to that comment (laughs) that you just Uh segued it beautifully So what I was going to say, and I'm going to add to what you're saying, is that through my loss and my growth and evolution as a spiritual being, you know, like like we all say, we're 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 not physical beings. We're we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. And so I believe that I learned that very early in my journey. Right. And that makes sense. But as I've grown in my spiritual journey and my evolutionary path as a soul, which I believe is why we come to earth into this incarnation is to continue to have our soul's evolution. And we're all trying to get to the point where we're so, our soul is so enlightened and in love with the world that we're all like Jesus, where Jesus was the way shower of the highest elevation of, of being in this incarnation that you could come to the earth in this plane, in this, what they call density and live as loving and as amazing as Jesus, but not 
all of us are there yet. Like you have to have multiple incarnations to actually achieve that level of right. Christ, you know? And so there he's, he is just our example of what is our own potential, you know? And so loving your neighbor as yourself and loving your siblings and choosing love and turning in the other cheek and all the lessons that have been taught through us through different texts. It's all about teaching us to how to become more of what our potential is. And so with that said, I would say that my understanding, you know, through my tragedy and my loss is that, and you just said, you know, we choose our parents and we choose this and that, you know, that's really hard to understand when you're actually going through a really shitty life experience. Like, why would I choose this? Why would I do that? Well, it's an opportunity for you to be challenged to choose that higher plane, that higher self, like what, and, and when you don't learn those lessons, you will have to come back and go through the shittier experience again until you choose the higher way of being. And then that tells your soul it's time for your next level of incarnation. And some people, you know, like, you know, I just lost my mom like two weeks ago and she was an amazing person. And it's, and I'm, you know, going to be a little emotional. I'm just going to say that when I was thinking about her eulogy, I was seeing how much of how she lived was really synonymous with some of the things that Jesus did. Like she was really into the children and she, she worked with children and she loved the little children. You know, that song, Jesus loves the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. I mean, she was just, she worked with two and three year olds and They when their little mom they're at the Mother's Day Out program, and when their mothers would be dropping them off for the first time for a separation from their mother for the first time in their lives, my mom was the go-to worker that could console the children to comfort. And so um I'm just sharing that I think my mom she she died quickly. There was no suffering, there was no incident, there was no stress. There was no hospitals like, because she didn't need that. She didn't need to go through that in order to continue some journey of her soul. Right. Right. She was at a place where she could just exit, just leave. And she just exited. And I believe that we can choose how we exit, you know? So Mm -hmm. if people are wondering Like, I don't want to suffer. Okay, we'll focus on what you do want and how you do want to exit and Mm -hmm. manifest that, you know, because you and I both believe in the law of attraction. And so Mm -hmm. um, I'm just sharing that because what I want to say is that people come into our world and the experiences come into our lives for our personal soul's growth. And so if I you know, my sister, Sharon, who did what she did, you know, basically for, I'm not going to go into it, but basically she committed suicide, creating an accident while I was standing right next to her. And so she wanted to create an accident to make it look like an accident. But in my mind, based on all the facts of everything I saw her do with her body and her hands, I know that it was her choice to want to end her life. And so that was a great struggle and a great challenge for me that set me on a path of my soul's growth. And I could have gone the other direction. I could have not chosen source. I could have not chosen light. I could have not chosen to evolve, to be happier and find joy. But that was in this carnation. That's my, that is my decision because God gives us free will. Source gives us free will to choose light or dark, you know, it's up to you. So Mm -hmm. if you want, I, I think like the suffering that we have is a choice. You choose to suffer. You choose how you respond to life. You don't choose what, I mean, some people are like, how do I choose that to happen to me? I mean, okay. So maybe you're not consciously aware of your choice. That's kind of like a determination you make before you come into this incarnation, but you can choose how you react to it. Okay. Even if you're not connected to being a part of a murder or being a part of something so tragic, like nine 11, that you didn't choose that fine. You don't have to believe like that, but what you can believe in is that you have a choice. You have the choice to choose how to respond to it. Right. 
Mark. Right. That's yes, that's exactly right. And it, it reminds me of um, an experience that I had in about two months after Lynn had passed away. And I felt like I needed, I felt she was trying to communicate with me maybe even further than the signs. And I wasn't developed at the time. So I felt like maybe I need to learn how to do that. And so I saw another ad in a paper that said that there was a (laughs) a medium in New York City um, who was basically going to teach people how to communicate with their past loved ones. So I I called up one of my friends. One I have one good one. I have many friends, but one of them is um, into this stuff, right? I'll just leave it at that. He's the only one out of my group of guy friends that's like, I, we can have these kinds of conversations. And um, so I called him up. I'm like, listen, Joe, I, I really want to, you know, go to take this workshop, learn how to communicate with past loved ones so I can see if I can talk to Lynn. And would you come with me? And he's like, yeah, I'm down. So we got the tickets. We, we traveled into the city. <laughs> and there was probably, you know, a couple hundred people there. It was in this huge like ballroom and the woman was a medium and she was teaching us like how to use meditation and things like that to communicate. And she's going around the room, like sort of like if, as she was traveling through the room, if she got a sign or a message from someone, she would stop and be like, you lost a daughter. Um, And when she passed away, you put her pink, like teddy bear in the coffin and the person like starts hysterical crying. And so everyone knows (laughs) on to something. So, you know, so she was like doing really well with, you know, in in terms of evidence, right. For what she was coming through with for these people. And then after about the first hour we went to break. And um, when we came back from break, she asked us, does anybody have any questions? And I was like all the way in the back. Like we were like, you just imagine like a ton of people there and I'm all in the back and I raise my hand and there's a, there's a sea of hands, but she's like, zero was in on me. You, you know? in the back. You in the back. <laughs> oh, man. What's the one question? named Mark, the man right. in the back named Mark. Exactly. So <laughs> I asked this question. I said, I understand that, you know, when our loved ones die, that they don't stop doing things in other words they're still learning they still have work to do they're still creating and i also understand that every time we think of them or we say their name that we're actually calling them to us and so i had this concern that like am i preventing lynn from doing the work that she needs to do over there by constantly thinking about her and asking her keeping her here in this realm yeah and so you know um she said, no, but that's not the story. She said, no, you're not. But she said, who did you lose? And I said, yeah, I lost someone. And she's like, yes, I know. She said, she's standing right behind you. And uh, she's here to tell you what her last moments on earth were like. Oh, and wow. the thing is, is that I was thinking about this constantly. You know, how like, was it? Because imagine she was on the 101st floor of a building, right? And so I had these thoughts, like, I know that the building collapsed. So I wanted to know if she was suffering. I thought about it constantly, but who could really give me that answer? So, I, you know, but it was something that was plaguing me. So she said, she's here to tell you what her last moments on earth were like. So she says like, somebody get me a microphone. And, and so somebody runs over, gives her a microphone. She comes all the way to the back and she starts saying that, um, I know that you've had these questions and she's here to give you the answers. When it was the end, she said they heard one loud boom, like the, like a loud crash, and they were getting a little bit worried, but um, there was a message that came over the um, PA system that said, just everybody stay where they are, everything's under control, don't go anywhere, don't panic, everything's fine. And a little while later, there was another le- like really loud boom. So, so that was the other building, right? The explosion, and, yeah. Yeah. And they were told again on the PA not to go anywhere. Everything was under control. Everything was fine. She said she, her biggest concern was that she couldn't get a call in. She wasn't able to call you. She wasn't able to call her siblings or her parents. The phones weren't working at all. And that was like the only one thing, but she felt very optimistic. She didn't feel like she was going to die or anything. So she wasn't like panicked in fear over that. And then she said that, um, all of a sudden smoke started to come in and fill the room. 
and she felt the ground sort of giving out under her. And as she started to feel the physical effects of the smoke, she saw angels everywhere. Like everywhere that she looked, she saw angels. And she said the angels surrounded all the people that she was with, and they carried everyone from this plane to the next. And she said it was the most beautiful thing that she had ever experienced in her entire life. And she said it wasn't only not painful, it was the most beautiful moment of my life. And she said, she and she wants you to know that she was never meant to suffer. She was meant to die that day, but the suffering was left for you. And I remember wow. you know, my, my thought was, and I'll be honest with you, like I'm selfish, like 21 year old guy. I'm like, what kind of a thing is that to say to somebody? Why would it be left for me? What did I do to deserve that? You know, but that's my story because that, you know, that kicked off my seven year journey of understanding and remembering. That's why the book is called remembering your spirit because it was like remembering Lynn and her spirit, but also remembering my spirit and, and the message of everybody remembering their spirit. Right. And, um, and now I can honestly say it's been over 20 years, right? And I can honestly say that, of course, I chose this. And of course, the suffering was immense. And of course, I wanted to experience that because it's all about knowing, right? Like we all came here to have these knowings, right? Because I would imagine that, you know, we're, we're, we're at home with the creator and some people call it heaven. So imagine we're in heaven and, and everything's perfect and beautiful and there's unconditional love and there's no harm and there's no stress and there's no fear. And then no challenge, no challenges, but we want to have this experience of the opposite of that. Right. So that's the physical experience where we come here and we experience the contrast and you can't really know something until you experience something. So if I wanted to know suffering, if I wanted to know all the things, you know, it's like, you know, love through the contrast of love, right? You know, you know, happiness through the contrast of happiness. <clears throat> so it's like, it would make sense that I would choose all of this. And it would make sense that the suffering was meant for me because that is why I am who I am. That's why I'm sitting here on a Wednesday afternoon, having a conversation about, oneness and spirituality and consciousness because it because it's it's with every breath that i take it's, it's most conversations that i have it's in my whole life is centered around it and i don't think any of it would be that way if it wasn't for the trauma the tragedy and the suffering that i went through i'm sure that yeah. probably with you. yeah and i just want to tell our listeners that um when we started i just told uh, mark that i said ideally i think listeners want to listen to like 30 to 35 minutes of a podcast and i said but if it's going really great we're going to go longer so i'm just letting y'all know i'm warning you that this is going really great and we're about to go longer so it's 42 minutes in and we're going to take it down the home stretch <laughs> because where I want to get to is that's all the tragedy. That's all the suffering that we've experienced that led us to the point where we are today. And now I want to talk about the podcast that you're doing, which is called the source podcast. I want to, Oh, this is source podcast. Yeah. I want to talk about why you created that? What are you doing on that podcast? And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the synonymous uh, journey that you and I created our podcast about and why we're doing the podcast and the kinds of things that you talk about. And I did want to mention before you start talking again, is that the Akashic Records I am familiar with, I was introduced to them in 2011. A guy did a thing on me that I wasn't searching for it. He like showed up in my life. And I was like, sure, do it. I don't care. And so he did it. And he said so many things. And one of the things he said that in my past life, I was trained as a soul to help people make their transition transition from this life to the afterlife. And so, God, that made so much sense why I was with my sister while she was suffering in her own physical pain and mm -hmm. wanting to end her life. Why did she engage my soul to be present for her? Like, why didn't she just kill herself by herself? Like, why did she have to involve me? Like, that's the kind right. of thought that I used to have. And so when he told me that, and that was 2011 was 
11, 22 years after, because this happened in 1991 mm-hmm. when my sister died. So 2011 was, you know, a 20 year period since the time I had experienced what I had experienced. And so I did an episode with that guy in 2022, that guy that did me in 2011, I invited him on my show and I am um, on the Wonder Junkie podcast to introduce the Akashic Records. So anyone who doesn't know what Mark was talking about for the Akashic Records, go to that episode called uh, with Jeremy. I can't think of his last name with Jeremy um, about the Akashic Records and go learn what the Akashic Records are. It's really fascinating for you to find out what are some of the lifetimes you've lived before. And it explains a lot about this lifetime, right? When you hear some of the stuff you've experienced and, you know, like one of the things he was looking at is like, I had starved in a previous life. I died of starvation. And so like, it kind of made sense why food was such an important aspect of my this incarnation, you know, so, or why it was a comfort. Why was food a comfort for me? Like, I don't, I don't have suffer from alcohol comfort or, you know, anything other kinds of addiction comforts, but food is definitely a comfort for me. So anyway, it's very fascinating for those of you who don't know. So back to Mark and uh, This Is Source podcast. So introduce us to the This Is Source podcast. Yeah. So This Is Source podcast is new. It's in its infancy stage. We, we're almost coming up on 30 episodes now. And I have a co-host. His name is Agris Blavux. And I met Agris through... Um, we, we basically both have the same mentor. So in that, and that's probably a whole um, other conversation. <laughs> we'll have to have about this By the way, I'm going to have you back, Mark, just so you okay. know, you're coming that back. Sounds, sounds good. <laughs> sounds really good. Uh, I enjoy my time with you immensely. So I, I would love that. But uh, Agris and I have the same mentor. So we became friends. He's from Latvia, but he resides now um, in uh, California. But I don't know. We we both were going through these crazy spiritual transformations. And this is in the past six months, by the way. You would think I would be like over it and done with it by now. But as you know, like it it just it just you're evolved. constantly evolving. Like, you're constantly evolving. And there's so many levels to to where we reach. Like we're always ascending and ascending and ascending and ascending. Um, and so you know, we used to just jump on the phone and have these really great conversations about spirituality and consciousness and oneness and uh, metaphysics and like vibrational frequency law, but like, and it would, you know, go on for hours. And one day I can't remember, I'm pretty sure it was him. Agra said, we should just turn this into a podcast. So I was like, all right, sounds good. And then other people can listen to what these conversations and maybe it will help other people or, or, you know what, maybe we'll just have a great time. And So we started this podcast and uh, it's been really, really awesome. We have lots of different guests on and and we talk about all those subjects, which is consciousness, oneness, um, healing. Um, But then we also get into trauma. We get into addiction. We get into tragedy. We get into, you know, there's so many levels uh, of entanglement in the human experience, right? And to your point um, about the Akashic Records and and gaining an understanding of past lives, in my opinion, anything we can do to be more self-aware is always going to lead us to a a place of more happiness and more peace in our own life. I mean, it's just, that's been my experience that, and there's so many levels to that, right? Like it's not just spirituality, even though spirituality happens to be my passion, there's also the psychology, there's mindset growth, there's healing, there's the physical body, there's the, what happened to you. Um, so we, you know, we talk all about that and we're going to have you on our show too, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's our yeah, show. This and, is so and, podcast. And full disclosure, I was scheduled for Monday and with my mom's estate sale and everything, I totally blanked out. So we have to reschedule that. So sorry. Yeah. That. And it's, it's totally fine because I completely understand it. And I appreciate you even trying to do all the work that you do on top of grieving the loss of your mom and going through the whole process of the estate. And it's just a lot. It's a lot. Closing down her life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, part of what you were saying, you know, it's about healing and self, you know, 
self-development and self-discovery is really where, and this is what my podcast talks about, when we heal ourselves and we're actually responsible for our own self-healing, not your partner, not your parents, not your boyfriend, girlfriend, your best friend, none of that matters. It's you working on you. If everyone just took that one responsibility and worked at healing their own pain, their own unhealed traumas, their own unhealed awarenesses, if they could, if anyone could just work on themselves, the world would be a much brighter and lighter and better place because we would all be walking around healed and not triggered by everything. And I'm not going to say that when you heal yourself, you don't still have triggers. I will say that you're more in control of yourself. And so when you are triggered, you're able to actually recognize the trigger and then not have that reaction that you might have had unconsciously before. And you can just say, okay, I'm feeling triggered. I don't like the way this feels. You learn tools about boundaries and setting yourself a little time before your reaction. And you just have a better experience in your life and in this incarnation when you do work on healing yourself. What would you say, Mark? I would say that this conversation is in perfect synergistic alignment. I couldn't agree more. I think that's the perfect way to slide into home with this because (laughs) that really is, that's exactly where I am. That's exactly where I am right now because I, I I made the discovery in the past six months and it was in the process of like my mentorship program. It was in the process of meeting Agris, the process of uh, creating the podcast and, and, and furthering and my coaching practice and, and the conversations that I have every day. I made the discovery very recently that I, suffered from the trauma of, you know, to, from 9-11, from 2001 till 2007. What I didn't realize until over 20 years later after 2001, that I never healed from the, tra- from the trauma that happened from childhood, from all the stuff that happened way before. So it's like, I never put this together at the time, but of course I would suffer so immensely when I was 21 years old after losing Lynn, not because, not only because of tragically losing somebody that you love, right. But also because I had no tools, right. I had absolutely no tools whatsoever for navigating through that. I had no awareness whatsoever. And also I wasn't even aware of what wasn't okay with me from before that, you know, and it never dawned on me that all of those highly emotionally charged states that I was experiencing were triggering a cascade of things that I had never dealt with from before that. So if you fast forward to where I am today in the last six months, I, that was the first thing we worked on in this program was shining a spotlight on those parts of me that had suffered trauma when I was a child that I had never looked at before, found a way, a safe, healthy way to navigate back, find those parts of me heal those parts of me, reintegrate them back into my experience. And you're exactly right when you say that the byproduct of that was compassion. And what I mean by that is all the people in my life who used to trigger me like crazy, right? And again, this could be a whole other conversation. (laughs) We could have an episode just on triggers. Right, exactly. Because because that was the, that's the hugest part of my story. The hugest part is the realization that I was being triggered. And I went through this crazy spiritual journey of learning as much as I could about spirituality. Every book, every guru, every workshop, seminar, you know, whatever I could get my hands on. And my goal was to be more spiritual. And I understood that that's what I came here to do. And I understood that that's, you know, was part of my mission. But my, you know what my biggest problem was? was that I, there was a there was a incompatibility with who I saw myself as or who I wanted to see myself at, as spiritually speaking and who I was real time in the real world and what i mean by that is like if if i was by myself i could meditate for 8 hours i can love the world i could love the flowers the trees listen to music but then all of a sudden you know your sister shows up 
or or your neighbor shows up or your coworker shows up and they trigger you and you're like and you know and like you start going like bananas and you're like whoa where did that come from who was that and and who am i really am i someone pretending to be spiritual and i'm really this like angry person that gets frustrated with all these people or or is that the real me you know there was this incompatibility like there was an inner conflict inside of me and and what i made this discovery in the past 6 months is that all those people that i was upset with they were all triggering parts of me that were not okay with things that happened a really long time ago and so when i made that discovery and i learned how to handle that how to heal those parts of me i wasn't being triggered by people anymore i just wasn't and and like you said even if it shows up even if somebody did trigger me i would i went from reacting to their that trigger to responding to what happened. And there's a process, as I'm sure you know yourself, of widening that gap so that when you are triggered, that you don't go immediately into that reaction, that you have a second to really sit back and go, of course you would say that thing to me. You know what I mean? Like, of course, with all that you've been through in your life and all the experiences that you have and all of the ways that you've been hurt, and all the healing you haven't done yet, and all of what you don't know about the bigger picture, of course that would lead you to say that really potentially hurtful thing to me. But I'm not hurt by that because there's some understanding there. That's hugely different from how dare you say that to me. Playing along, getting hooked in to the to the, um, the game, you know, the dance, I I read a book really early on, right after Sharon died called the dance of anger. It was one of the first Mm -hmm. books I read and you attract people who are going to help you evolve. But if you don't choose to grow from it, then you will continue to dance with them. So when you start healing yourself and start working on yourself and they come to you to want to dance, then you have that choice. And I want to give people this tool that I've learned. And that is that if you can learn how to see yourself, uh, like be the observer of your life, then you're separate. You're not in your life. You're watching how your life unfolds. And then Mm -hmm. as the observer, which is like your higher mind, then you can make decisions from the higher mind into what this Lydia how does Lydia want to react to this comment? How does Lydia want to respond? And so you just kind of slow your pace down a little bit so that you have a time to respond in a way that more is more in alignment with who you want to be, right? If you're like, if Jesus is your role model or whatever, and that's where you think you're headed, how, how you know, what would Jesus do? And I texted my friend. And by the way, I just want to tell everybody, like, I am so not religious. In fact, I grew up religious and I used to re- reject religion and for 25 years because it turned me off how they hijacked Jesus. But actually, recently, when I read The Law of One um, by Ra, I realized that it was the church that is using Jesus to weaponize Jesus so that the church can have control over humanity. So when you learn the difference between the religious control that's negative side of religion and the religious parts that are love and of love, then you can separate the two and you can appreciate the religion for all the good that it does offer and and, and let all the bad stuff go out with the bathwater. So I used to say like, I threw out the baby, the baby Jesus. I threw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus because he was part of religion. But what I realized is that, that, that religion bathwater, that's nasty can be thrown out and you can still have Jesus as a role model and a way shower. And that was recent. That was in the last year that I learned that from reading the are listening. Actually, I have audible, um, the law of one, and it's all about what is oneness and what does oneness mean and how, what is our existence and what is our life. And I've talked about that book on my show already. And I even wanted to have the guy who channeled raw. He's still alive. He's like in his eighties. I wanted him on the show, but he's like, not necessarily like available for everything. So anyway, um, in wrapping up Mark, yes. So 
being an observer and being able to respond to your life and what you want to choose your life to be. Because what I know you and I both agree on is we are creating, we are co-creating. So this is source is because source lives and breathes through us and we are co-creating with our creator, our lives. And actually people are, this is going to blow people's mind, but it's my understanding that God is experiencing life and love and joy through us, through our expression. What is your thought on that, Mark? I mean, I think it's, I think it's so well said. I think that it's such the way you're articulating it makes it, in my opinion, really easy to understand. I think that the way anybody can like segue into this, if you're brand new to this whole way of thinking is to practice being the observer. It's really about, and and I'm going to give you one quick example of what I experienced this morning. Um, you know, when we are, we, when my co-host is done editing the podcast and loads it up to YouTube, you know, he'll usually give me, um, a heads up like okay it's on youtube and then i have to go on youtube and then i have to start spreading and you know like we have a system so i wait for that cue and i and i watched the whole youtube video of my last interview and i started watching it and i and i started criticizing myself as i was watching it and i said oh i should have said it this way this is what this is. and then i heard a voice say he did he did just fine it was great and then I'm like, oh, who shit. said that? <laughs> who am I? Am I the one that wasn't okay with what I said in the YouTube video? Or am I the one that approved of how he did in that video? So I yes. immediately grabbed my phone and I started messaging Agris really quick. I'm like, I just had the weirdest experience, blah, 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 you know, about, and I started talking it out and we went back and forth. And that's why it's helpful to have like-minded people in your life that you could like sort this out with, right? But then you bring this up and this is exactly where we came to in our conversation, which is that practice being the observer of what Mark is experiencing and then co-create. Like it's it, it's too much to get into at, at this end, but we could definitely bring this up next time. But when you said observer, I feel like, that's just really what it is. It's observing what's happening and co-creating from sources perspective, right? Which some people call the soul. Um, co-creating your experience, right? Through the host, almost like, it's funny because I'm looking at you and it says host, you know, <laughs> and that's really what it is. Like you're hosting right. sources experience, yeah. And source can only experience everything that you create for source to create. And, but you can, you can be in, you can be compatible with that. You can be in alignment with that. You can join forces with source energy and you can co-create together, or you can cut that part out and you'll still survive. You know, like some people say this is, um, and it's illusion. It's an illusion, by the way. But um, but like if you were like living just in ego, right? And I I'm careful when I say ego because I know everyone wants to slay the ego. And I'm not trying to say anything like that. I'm just saying that there's a way for you to live your life and to cut all that stuff out. But that's where all the suffering comes in. That's where all the confusion comes in. That's where usually the messes that we make in our life. But my point is is that like let's break it down like this. If if I didn't allow for that other part of me to show up and say he did just fine and for me to understand there that I I might be bigger than just Mark Chavis, I might be the observer of Mark Chavis, right? Then I know that there's nothing that I really need to do differently about who I am as a person in order to feel good about if I did a good job or a bad job. Like I did the best that I could and I'm okay with that. But that's different from like, oh, I need to do this. I need to lose 10 pounds. I need to get a public speaking coach. I need to, get, you know, like we're like if, when we're operating in that mentality of like just being purely physically only human and cutting out the whole like, no, the real, the real who I really am is the observer of what Mark Chavis is experiencing in, in this lifetime. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. It's a lot to say. 
Yeah. I, when you were telling me that you were judging yourself, I was thinking like, that's your ego. And then the voice was your higher mind, your higher self yes. who knows, who knows who you really are. But the exactly. ego is trying to make you, um, you know, be more in control. The ego is all about control, which is also like not of God, not of source. And I, have you ever heard this term edging God, God out? out. Yes. Yeah, ego. So when, I think that's talking, perfect. when, when we were, you were talking, I was thinking like, that's what you're saying. It's edging yeah. God out is the ego. So, yes. Yeah. So I know you have another appointment, so we have to wrap up, but we'll get you on the calendar and let's do part two <laughs> of this conversation because there's so much more, you know, you might become my regular fun guest to talk fun with because i don't have a co-host so yeah, i think it would yeah. be fun to have you come that back would be on. Great. that would be great and i just want to say that the last thing that you said was perfect that's that's choosing different words for the exactly what i was trying to express so thank you for saying it in that way because that's exactly what it is it's the higher self you know versus the ego and the more we pay attention to this and the more we incorporate this idea the more life becomes so much more fun and we're, we can just relax and let life flow the way it was meant to flow and stop forcing ourselves so much to be a certain type of a person and, and all of the events in our life have to be a certain kind of way. We can just relax and enjoy and observe and allow life to flow through us the way it was meant to instead of trying to, like you said, edge God out and try to take total control of like every aspect of life because that's just exhausting and not fun at all. So. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, and what we're going to talk about when I'm on your podcast is I'm all about freedom and mm. that's what free will is in the Bible. It talks about free will, but raw talks about free will as well. And so freedom and then how to create joy after you've had great tragedy. So if y'all want to find more of, about following Mark and what all him and Agris are up to, you can go to the This Is Source podcast on all probably the major platforms. But also he's got a book that we talked about, Remembering Your Spirit. And where can they buy that? Is that on Amazon? It's on Amazon. Yep. Okay. I'm, I may put a link on this description so y'all can find it easily and effortlessly because that's what I'm about. Easy and effortlessly. <laughs> so thank you so much, Mark. Oh my gosh. I loved today. I loved our episode. I can't wait to have you back and we'll schedule some other topics because Mark is a coach. We didn't even talk about this, but Mark <laughs> has been a coach for over, you said 11 years, did you? Yeah. Or Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's been working. Oh, and I want to say, we talked about this before we started, like he was a coach before coaching was cool. Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he's been a coach for a long time, helping people, probably people going through great loss and tragedy and how to find resolution and peace in their heart mm -hmm. and their soul and how to get back to living because if you realize that everything that happens to you was for your own personal soul's growth and you don't have to worry about like, I don't have to worry about what Sharon's journey was or why she needed to commit suicide. Like she had her own soul journey that was about her and what she's going through. But the players in your play are all there for your journey. So how are you going to work on what your journey is there to be discovered. Sometimes you need a coach. Sometimes you need a help. Sometimes you need a partner who's willing to listen to you and discuss it with you. And that's the kind of support that Mark is offering to people in the world. Mark, do you have a website to tell them to yeah, go to? Yeah, markhabus.com. And that's C-H-A-B-U-S.com. That's right. M-A-R-K. -A All right. He's got another appointment. We got to let him go. Ciao for now, and we will see you later. Bye, Mark. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We've reached the end of this episode. If you'd like to continue with this inspirational journey, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out. If you're a self-proclaimed oneness junkie, get yourself a t-shirt and spread the message of oneness in your community. And finally, if you have a story to share or know someone that should be a guest on this podcast, 
contact us at onenessjunkie.com. See you next time. And remember, when we heal ourselves, we heal the world. Compassion starts with you and me.